In the book of Psalm 51, or I should, I should say in Psalm 51, I want you to hear these words. According to the New King James Version, it reads as follows. A prayer of repentance to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. That, that opens up the foundation of this particular psalm. So we have to understand it in its, its, its context. Listen to these words. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desired truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make, <laughs> make me to no wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. <coughs> Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a bro and a, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Let's pray. Father, once again, we come before your presence honoring you as our God. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who came, lived and died and is alive today. We are his children. We are his followers. And by virtue of our relationship with Jesus, Father, we gain access into your presence. And with that in mind, Father, we want to enter into your courts and into your presence today. Spirit of the living God, being among us. I pray for an unction, a special anointing from the Holy Spirit of the living God today that I may minister this your word to those who desire to hear. Change us and transform us, Father, by your spirit and by your word. Speak to us with clarity, even today, as we honor your son, as we magnify Jesus, and bring you glory, Father. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated in the house of the Lord. I'm going to ask you this morning a few questions. A few questions of introspection. Questions that quite possibly only you can answer for yourself right where you are even now, or maybe where you have been. If I was to pose the question this morning, how many of us today here are children of the Most High God by virtue of our relationship with Jesus Christ? I would venture to say that most of us would raise our hand. 
and say, that's who I am. I, I am a child of God. I am not ashamed to say that I am a child of God. With that in mind, I'm going to ask you to, once again, look introspectively inside of yourself. And I'm going to ask you and pose these questions to you as to whether or not in, our, in your relationship, in your walk with the God that you serve through His Son, if you have ever fallen short of the glory of God. Anyone here? Somewhere in your life, something has happened as you acknowledge, or after, even after you have acknowledged that you are a child of God. I saw a number of hands that just went up. I, I wonder if there's anyone here today that, that, that has possibly placed yourself in a position that maybe others would look at you and question your relationship with the living God. I see some hands. I see some hands just, just went up. I, I wonder if there's anyone here today that, that maybe by virtue of, of what we have done uh, as children of God, that, that some area of our life or something that has happened or, or something that we were involved in has brought us shame, a semblance of shame, regret, possibly remorse. Anyone here? Have you been there before? I see a number of hands just went up, a number of hands, saying that as we as the children of God have in some way or another at some point in time fallen short of the glory of God. Because of those situations and those circumstances, ha have you ever felt that maybe uh, you now might be going through consequences by virtue of what you have experienced in your past. I see, I see, once again, I see a number of hands of affirmation. Maybe there are those that, that have reached a place that because of, of these things, they might begin to question whether or not God yet has a plan for their life. Maybe because of, of guilt or, or, or maybe, may, maybe today you've gone through a period of what I often refer to as, as self-condemnation. Maybe you don't need anyone to condemn you for what you have done, but because maybe no one else knows or is aware, you condemn yourself. Self-condemnation. Maybe there's no one here to, to bring you degradation where they, they consistently degrade who you are. Maybe we go through self-degradation because we know who we are. We know how we are. We know where we have fallen short. Well, this morning, I, I, I hopefully and prayerfully, through the life of David, once again, I can convey to you the idea that yet we serve a forgiving God, that we serve a God of restoration, a God of reconciliation, a, a God that can take you from where you have been or what you have done and place you in a place that he desires for you to be in your destiny in God's purpose for you. I often try to remind you that you today are not here by mistake. I also want to help you to understand that as we surrender our lives to the Lordship of Christ, our lives purpose. So, so, so I can once again acknowledge and ask the question, how many of you, since you have become a child of God, since you have responded to Jesus Christ, now feel as though your life has definable divine purpose on this side of heaven? I see the hands. Well, in order to understand the context of this particular psalm, I have to remind you exactly how it came into fruition and what had occurred. A number of weeks ago, I brought to you a message on the life of Ahithophel. He's the counselor of the king. Reminded you that, that there was a time where he aligned his life with King David. And yet because of situations that would, would occur, of which I'm going to touch on today, it changed his desires, it changed his intentions, Ahithophel's intentions, his, what he seemingly were, was his purpose, to be a counselor of the king. And there was a time that he rebelled and we came to the understanding that there was a reason why, because of the situations that would unfold and how it impacted this man named Ahithophel. This morning, I'm going to once again 
revisit this area of scripture. Not in its fullness or totality, but rather to help you to understand the context of Psalm 51. So over the past number of weeks, we, we've learned of so many things about this life of David, King David. Over the past couple of weeks, we, 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 we've seen him in his place where he finally was beginning to, to, to reach this place that God had ordained for his life to become the king of the nation of Israel. We saw that there were different portions of times in his life where he was anointed for a specific purpose. Samuel identifying him as the man that God has chosen, anointing him as the future king. There came a time when, when, when those of Judah uh, would, would, would anoint David as their king. But yet that was not his ultimate destiny. And, and that leads me to believe that there are times in our lives where, where maybe we, we, we experience a semblance of the purpose of God in our life, but, but, but maybe we're not yet quite where it is intended for us to ultimately be. You see that in his life. After King Saul died in battle, all the inhabitants of Israel came to David and, and, and anointed him as the king of all of Israel. His definable destination, his definable purpose, the reason why he was ultimately allowed to, to, to be who God desired for him to be, to, to lead the people of God. So, as is our custom, I, I believe that there are times when, when situations occur in our lives. Now, now, now we're in a pretty good place, and, and even we as the, the children of God find ourselves in, in a pretty good place here. Remember, anointed of Samuel, anointed of Judah, anointed of all of Israel. Now, he is, he is reigning in his position as the king of Israel. But then things began to happen. Many of those things you'll, 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 you'll understand as you read. And, and, and through, through the, many of the Psalms, you'll, you'll learn of some of the characteristics of this man. How, how, how many of the Psalms that we often read were scribed by David himself. I have a number that I can give you, that I can share with you his heart. In Psalm 18:3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So I'd be saved from my name. David was very reverent. Once again, a number of areas in the book of Psalm that David, David, the Psalms, but David would express not only his knowledge, but his relationship with the God that he served. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We often hear those words or, or quote those words. And yet David, once again, is conveying the idea, expressing himself, understanding that it was the Lord that is his light and his salvation. That, it, that he, he, he asked the question, whom shall I fear? If the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Conveying the idea that as long as I am in covenant with the living God, there is no one that I should fear. For the Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? And as, as we read a number of these Psalms, I, I know that you and I can, can relate to those words. How, how many of us can this morning, once again, acknowledge or, 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 or with enthusiasm, share the heart of David and say these words, that the Lord is my light and my salvation, even today. How many feel, how many believe that even now, even in your life, right now? I mean, right now. And notice what he says. He says, the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In times that, like these today, when all of these things are going on all around us, what better time to remind ourselves that it is the Lord who is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Oh yes, but we, we might see the circumstances of the day. We, we might know what's going on all around us and maybe we, there's trepidation. Maybe we don't know what, what's going to occur. But I'm here to remind you this morning that it is the Lord Most High who is in, not only in control, but is our strength. He, are, he is our ever-present help in time of trouble. Someone in this place knows what I'm talking about, even now. 
of whom shall I be afraid? David was very trusting. Oh, in Psalm 18, too, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength. In whom will I trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower? Over and over and over again in the Psalms, David conveyed what he knew about his God. But then we come to this place in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And once again, I'm simply going to give you a synopsis of what occurred. I'm not going to read to you all these verses. because, As I stated, we were here just a number of weeks ago. But I want to remind you what happens in, in this context of, of these verses. The Bible tells us in, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11 that it's springtime. Uh, and you understand that it's springtime. That was a time that, that, that nations would often go into battle during that time of year. We could say that it was considered the time of war. So here in springtime, which is the time of war, David ha has sent his army to out to fight the Ammonites. You can read this in context. But in this instance, in this situation, he stays in Jerusalem, now the city of peace, now where, where, where his capital was. And, and the Bible says that one day David, he, he's taken a stroll on the palace roof. And as he's there, because he did not go into battle, uh, the Bible tells us that he, he happens to see a beautiful woman who was bathing nearby. This is what the Bible says. And, and because of that situation, in spite of recognizing that, that maybe that was a time to just simply go about his business and go back to inside to where it was, that's not what happened. For the Bible says that David uh, goes on and, and it says, it says he saw her and she was very beautiful to behold. She was beautiful to behold, which gives the idea that David continued to behold her beauty. So something happens and, and he, because of, of, of what he uh, was just experienced, he, he sends someone to figure out who this woman is. And it turns out that her name is Bathsheba. Now, now, I don't think that her name has anything to do with the mere fact that she was bathing and her name became Bathsheba. You know, I often tell you that, that names have very, a tremendous amount of significance and their meaning has purpose. That's the first time I've ever pondered that thought. But I, but I just convey that to you so that you'll recognize that probably has nothing to do with what that means. So look at what happens. David sends his messengers to bring her to him. And she comes. And David being king now, because more than likely he too, just like Saul, became a little bit comfortable in his role. Now is the king. You see, the king would determine whatever the king wanted to do as he would lead the nation. He was in a place of prominence, in a place of authority. And oftentimes, one of the things that you will learn about the kings in the word of God is that they would get to a place oftentimes where they realized that they were supreme in the nation. So in essence, they could do whatever they wanted to do. And oftentimes there would be no, no recourse. There would be nothing that would occur based upon the decisions that the kings made. And here is David recognizing exactly what happened now, now I want you to get this as I read just a few of these verses so so David sent and inquired about the woman and someone said is this not Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam the wife of Uriah the Hittite so so they reminded David now, now they're not saying well David I, I think that this her name quite possibly might be Bathsheba no no that's not what you see here what ha what what's going on here they're they're telling David David this is who she is She's the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David, we, we know who she is. And in essence, they're posing this question under, under uh, the, the impression that David, you should know who she is or, or this is who she is. And David, in, in their roundabout way, without even saying a word, they're saying, stay away from her, David. She's married to another man. But look at what happened. Then David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her for she was cleansed from her impurity and she returned to her house now here was the king determining that he was king 
quite possibly uh, feeling as though as king, he could do whatever the king wanted to do. And we see what occurred. But the woman, the Bible says, the woman conceived. And so she woke, goes and she tells David, I am with child. Now, now, because of that situation, in that moment of beholding this woman, not only of beholding, but then taking action, responding to what he saw, determining that he wanted to know who she was, had her come to his place, his palace, and now, because he has now been with her, she is with child, the wife of another man. Then David said to Joab, notice what happens. Then David said to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. Understanding that this man that, that he's now calling for is the husband of this woman. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Job was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. Now just seemingly enter into conversation with this man, yet inside knowing exactly why and what his motives were. And David said to Uriah, Uriah, listen to what he says. Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. But, but I want you to see what's going on here. It, it, it in, there, are, there are inferences in this, in this portion of scripture that will help you to understand what David was doing. Notice what it says in verse 9. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and did not go down to his house. You see, David understanding that, that this man is married to this woman with whom I have just had a relationship with. I, I'm going to have him come to me. I'm going to send him home. And typically what might happen with, with a husband and a wife is something that could possibly cover up what I have done. So look what happens. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark of Israel and Judah are dwelling in the tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I go then go down to my house and eat, drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Now, now I, what, what I want you to understand is this, this man, when you understand this, is that Uriah is referred to as Uriah the Hittite. There are those that would come to David that were not necessarily of the covenant people of God, but they would come and they would join him. Why? Because they believed in him. They saw his leadership. They knew that God had anointed him. They believed in what he would do. And now in this situation, Uriah the Hittite reminds David that the ark of Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in open fields. And saying, listen, the ark of God is in a place that, 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 that might be, there might be some things that could occur and all those that are yet desiring or in, entering the battle, they are in dwelling places and they're encamped in open fields. And, 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 and shall I go and rest? Sh sh shall I go and eat at my own house and be with my wife while all these other areas are not quite where they should be? Showing a semblance of integrity. I venture to say that at that moment in time, there could have been a, something that occurred even in the mind and heart of David. Here is this man, a Hittite, who understands the importance of these things. And yet I, even in my kingship, have taken it for granted. He says, as you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, wait, here today also and tomorrow, I will let you depart. Now, David contemplating what he would do or, or how he would rectify this situation, quite possibly saying, well, well maybe this is how he or beginning to, 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 to in his own mind, uh, figure out that maybe if, they, if Uriah just stays here for a, a few more days, that maybe he will handle it differently as we go forward. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now, when David called him, he ate and drank before him and he made him drunk. 
And at the evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of, of, of his Lord. But he did not go down to his house. David now uh, trying to find another way to possibly get Uriah to just simply go home and be with your wife. But it didn't happen. Yes, this is King David, the man after God's own heart. The, the man who was anointed and, and found and identified to be the king of the nation of Israel. This is David. And I don't say those words in any way to, to, to be critical. For, for what comes to my mind is, is we understand exactly the destiny of David and how he will once again forever be known as the greatest king of the nation of Israel. But yet we see David involved in this situation at this time. I don't know about you, people of God, but that does not bring me any type of negative emotion in any way. For, for if anything else, or if anything, it brings me encouragement. It gives me hope. For, for in spite of what happens here, in spite of what we're seeing, God never reneges on his covenant promise to David. So look at what occurs. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and set it by the hand, his hand of Uriah. Uh, Uriah. Now, now I'm just going to simply tell you what occurs. David sends a letter to Joab. And if you read it in context, for the sake of time, I, I won't read all these verses to you. You can go back and read them for yourself. David sends a letter to Joab. And, and ultimately, he, he tells him to put Uriah out in the, in the fiercest part of the battle. And then for him to draw back, that Uriah would be killed. You could read it in context, and you will see that David has Uriah himself deliver that letter to Joab. How many would say that that is behavior that is very unbecoming of the king of the nation of Israel? But that's what you see. So, so now what happens? Joab, he accomplishes this very thing and he does exactly what David told him to do. But there are others that are killed in battle as well. Ultimately, what occurs is, is, is that uh, Joab uh, tells David that what he desired for him to do has now been accomplished. Listen to what he says in, in, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. Verse 21, who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerobeth Seth? Was it not a woman on, who cast a, a piece of a millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Now, David accomplishing exactly what he intended to do. So, so, so now, listen to these words. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him by, by him. And the messenger said to David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot uh, from the wall at your servants and some of, some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Your servant is dead. Then David said to the messenger, thus you shall tell, say to Joab, listen to what David says, go tell Joab this, do not let this thing displease you, for your sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. David says, so encourage him. David, David now, now saying, listen, Joab, this is just part of war. This is what happens in battle. People are killed, Joab. Uriah was killed, yes, Joab, but, but this happens in battle, Joab. He could have been killed any other way. He, he, said, he said, don't let this, this thing displease you, Joab. But when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, look at what David did. David sent and brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. 
But there's a very important verse or words that are rendered in that last verse. Notice what it says once again. She became his wife and bore him a son. Oh, now, now David may be thinking that, okay, okay, I, I, yes, I've done this, but now no one's going to know. Yes, I know Joab knows that I, what I did. I told him to put Uriah at the very fiercest part of the battle. And yes, he got killed, uh, but no one else has to know. No, no one, no, now, now I can just go about living my life and, and being the king of Israel. And, and I'm just going to keep on going. But I didn't read these words to you. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. You see, you see, as we read those verses and culminate or conclude chapter 11 with those words, it reminds us that though it seemed as though God was not necessarily physically present there in those scriptures, we know that he is everywhere. We know that he sees. We know that he knows. Now, now here in that situation now, all of a sudden David possibly feeling as though, okay, it's over, it's happened. I, I don't have to think about it anymore. I don't have to in any way revisit this because now it is over. But how many know people of God that oftentimes in the kingdom of God, things are not always over? Let me say that one more time. L let me see if we can simply in, in any way related to our conditions, our situations today. Then in spite of how things are, how things are going, things are not yet over in the sight of God. Let me share with you what occurs. I'm going to transition into our portion of scripture in Psalm 51. The Bible says that in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, what would happen next? The Bible says, and the Lord sent Nathan who was the prophet to David. And I've read to you this account. I've read to you over and over this, this experience of what occurred. And, and, and so for the sake of this message, once again, I'm going to just read a portion of it. And, and once again, hopefully perfectly do its justice in its context. Nathan comes to David and he says, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he brought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. Remember now Nathan the prophet conveying or, or telling David this account. And it was like a daughter to him, the ewe lamb to, to, to this man. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who would come. Nathan, the prophet, telling David this account of, of, of this rich man or this man who refused to kill his own lamb out of the many that he had, but took one from a man who had very little, for he was a poor man who had nothing. Yet he took his lamb and sacrificed that you lamb to this wayfaring man. So the Bible tells us that David, that his anger was greatly aroused against the man. Hearing the account that Nathan was, was, was revealing to him, now listening intently of what had occurred. And David, and the Bible says, he says these words, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David acknowledging that in the context of what he was just told, there was no pity that was shown to this poor man. He said because he did this thing and he had no pity. Then to David's surprise, Nathan said this to David. The, the moment he said, because he did this thing and because hey, he had no pity, be his anger being aroused of how one man could be so selfish and so self-centered that he would do this type of thing. And Nathan now turns and says to David, you are the man. I, I, I can't imagine at that very moment in time how, how David must have felt. 
understanding that, that now the prophet of God had come to him and identified him and what he had done. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, now speaking through the prophet Nathan, the Lord speaking to David, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have given you much more. But I want you to see the responses that will occur. Now, Nathan, continuing to, 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 to reveal to David what thus saith the Lord, why have you despised the commandment of the Lord and do this evil in his sight? No, notice, notice, now Nathan, no, not, not necessarily being a witness to what had occurred, but somehow being conveyed the message from the spirit of the living God to go and tell David. He said, why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Why have you killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword? You have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, now, David's actions made known specifically to David. Not only does the prophet Nathan know, but there are others. But even more importantly, the God that he loved also knew. But because of this situation, this is what I want you to see, is that often in our lives, our decisions, our actions have ramifications. You'll see what Nathan says to David, because what he has done, notice what he says. You've killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and you have killed him with the sword of Ammon. Now, therefore, the short sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. And you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite, your wife. Notice what he says. You're going to see a few things, a number of things here that, that David is told of what would happen. Because of what you have done, David, the sword will never depart from your house. Remember last week, the blessed house. I want my house to be blessed. David wanting the presence of the ark of God in the city of Jerusalem, wanting his city to be blessed. And now this week, this today, we see exactly what occurred because of David's actions, maybe in his complacency or in just feeling overly confident about his relationship or just simply not focusing on who he was. Now, in this situation, being told, because of what you have done, the sword will never depart from your house. In other words, there will always be turmoil. There will always be battles, even in your house. Yes, David, you are the man after God's own heart. Yes, I have promised you to, to establish your kingdom forever. But because of what you have done, David, this is what will occur. It's because he says, he says, this will occur because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord. Now, the second thing that will happen. Behold, I will raise up adversaries against you from your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this, of, of this son. Now, not only would the adversaries come from without the city or, or, or the, the people, but David, even in, even in your own house, in your own home, the Lord says, I will raise up adversaries against you from your own house. Ramification of what had David had done, consequence of what David had done. He says, for you did it in secret, but I will do this before all of Israel. The Bible says exactly what Nathan goes on to say David to David. He says, and Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin and you shall not die. That, that even, even if, once again, as I read those verses and I internalize them, I, I am so uh, blessed in my spirit that knowing that in spite of all that had occurred, the promise was yet made to David. The Lord has also has put away your sin and you shall not die. That's what I want you to understand because of David and what he had done, the consequences for his actions uh, from the Old Testament scriptures would require his death. And now he says, he says, you shall not die. However, because this deed of this deed, you have given great occasions to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Notice what happens now. The child also who is born to you 
shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. Four things that would occur. The sword will never depart. Adversaries will be raised against you from your own home. Your child will, will die. And the reason why this will, has occurred, because, listen to what he says. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. If there's anything that you and I can relate to, it's this very thing. Well, notice what he says in verse 14. However, because by this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Did you get that? Nathan saying to David, the king of Israel, the king ordained by God, that because of what you have done, you have given others a reason to blaspheme the most high God. If there's any reason why you and I should be cognizant of what we do, there might be ramifications or consequences for our actions. But one of the greatest detriments of our actions could often be that we will give others reason to blaspheme the God that we serve. I know that many of us want to live an upright life, a life that is blameless unto the living God. But that is one of the main reasons why you and I are to guard our hearts, to guard our minds, that we may continue to walk in the ways of God. Now, now once again, from that perspective, that is the account of what had occurred. At that moment in time, now David, understanding that everyone was to know or was going to know exactly what had occurred. And this takes us to Psalm 51. See, oftentimes we read this Psalm 51 and we, we, we personalize it and there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. Where we, we receive those scriptures and, and we take them in and, and they can apply to me. But you must understand that Psalm 51 is about David and how he felt. The emotion that he experienced. And, and one of the things that you'll learn as, as you begin to read this, you, you will see a number of things that, that are very, very important. And I'm going to try to hopefully and prayerfully share them with you. You see, Psalm 51 is one of what I believe are seven psalms that are referred to as, as penitential psalms. Psalms that convey the idea of repentance, of remorse, of desiring forgiveness, of recognizing the actions that one had done, and, and now coming to, to, to God and saying, yes, I, I recognize, but Lord, I want forgiveness. I need restoration. I need reconciliation. It's one of the Psalms that, that many of us will often turn to when we in turn have fallen short of the glory of God, and we do not want to lose what we have in Him. Let me begin to read. David, in verse 1 of Psalm 51, uses these words in the context of this situation as it pertained to Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. David initially, once again, recognizing how he felt and how he was feeling and what he had done and the fact that God himself was aware and all these things were now going to happen because of what David had done. Now he says, have mercy upon me. When I read those words, I, I can't help but remember and recognize that those words are some of the initial words that God desires to hear from every one of us. I would venture to say that most of us have found ourselves there. When you come to the realization of who we are in the natural, I would venture to say that most of us in the natural would identify ourselves as those who would do or, or, or live a life that is contrary to the purposes of God. We can identify those things. I wonder how many of us in retrospect can look back at our lives and, and identify areas, turning points, defining moments in our lives when we knew once again that we were outside of the will of God. Most of us can identify something if we have been there. But, but now David comes and he says, have mercy upon me. In other words, don't give me what I deserve. And I see that as we go through some of these verses this morning, 
that I, I truly desire for you, if you have ever found yourself here, if you've ever found yourself in a situation where you know that you know that you know that you have transgressed the will of God in your life, where maybe for whatever reason, even as a child of God, you were taken in, you were allured, you were enticed, you were tempted by something that would get you out of the will of God. Yet as a child of God, here was David, the king of all of Israel. As though God is conveying to us or revealing to us the idea, if it can happen to David, it can surely happen to you and to me. So now David, have mercy upon me, O God, knowing and understanding that's who he was going to. He, he said, according to thy loving kindness, loving kindness, even though he had sinned, even though he had fallen short, even though he committed the transgression, he comes to God and says, have mercy upon me according to your loving kindness. David knew that his forgiveness or restoration, it was available. Why? Because he understood the loving kindness of God. I'd venture to say that even in his own heart, there were those, we, and we learn once again, Ahithophel became so angry because of his actions and others became so angry because what they have learned about David, they were ready to judge him. Many of him, his followers left him because of what he had done. But now, he goes to the place that he needs to go above all areas or all places. He finds himself in the presence of God, praying, or singing, writing, ascribing these words. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. This is according to your loving kindness. God, Lord, God I in heaven, I know the kind of love that you have. I, I know that you have tender mercies that we don't deserve, that I don't deserve. But, 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 Lord, but I'm, I'm asking you, have mercy and blot out my transgressions. See, once again, as I, as I read these verses, I, I come to realize that this is a prayer, this is a psalm that we simply cannot ignore. And for some of you today, this is a psalm that you desperately need. I, I have been there. I know what it's like to desperately need this psalm. And I know I'm not the only one. The good news is that it can apply to every one of us here today. So let me continue to go forward. No, no, notice what he says. Because in the context of these words, there's an important element that must be present within us. There, there, there must be an initial perspective or attitude that must be found in those words from us. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I've been there. I, I know what that's like. I, I know in my life when there was a time that I, I believed that God was leading me and drawing me so that he could use my life. But I knew who I was. And more importantly, I knew how I was. Disqualifying myself from being used of God because of self-condemnation and self-degradation. Oh, those moments in time when I knew the Spirit of God was drawing me and calling me, I kept reminding God, but God, don't you remember what I've done? Don't you remember how I am? Don't you remember my weaknesses and my shortcomings? And, and, I, and I fought against the calling of God. Why? Because of these very things. Knowing who I was as a sinner. But it's not just me. For the Bible reminds us that we've all have all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. At this time, David comes not in his own position, not in his own calling or purpose, not in his own righteousness. He pleads for the mercy of God. He, he, he comes just with the idea of understanding that, that God, I need your mercy. And begins to make this request according to the loving kindness of God. 
Why is it that God can forgive us when we come to him through his son? Because of his loving kindness. Because of his tender mercies. I venture to say that every person in this place, if you were all in, in all honesty with yourself, recognize that somewhere you have gotten out of God, the will of God, and maybe your life seems so contrary to the will of God. But in spite of how we have been, we serve a God of loving kindness. That even in our worst moments in time, even when we simply can't even look in the mirror because we don't like what we see, the God that, that created all things, yet desires fellowship with us, his loving kindness. David now, like many of us who have found ourselves in this situation, he knows that God is full of love, that he's full of kindness and mercy. But, but, but notice what he, what he goes on to say as I continue to read. Now as David comes in, in, in this situation, he, 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 he uses these words. He says, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse my sin. But I want you to see once again, as, as we read these verses and, and, and these words, I dig deeper. Because oftentimes we come through this, the, 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 what we understand, the word wash, we, we know, uh, we bathe, we wash, we, we get the dirt off of us. Yes, yes, there is that physical element. But this word actually signifies his desire for inward purification. See, many of us can come with the intention of oh God. Why? Now I, my sins have been identified. Now I'm in trouble. Lord, forgive me. Show me your loving kindness. Get me out of this situation. But David's heart was, Lord, I, I recognize what I've done. I'll acknowledge what I've done. But I'm asking you, I can see that because of who I am, I am falling short and I want you to come into me. I want you to wash me thoroughly from the inside. I want you to change me from the inside. The word cleanse. Notice, notice it says, cleanse me from my sin. This word is, is more of, of a term that identifies a process. A, a procedural change that occurs according to the person of God. If you were to understand it in its context, it was as though David understanding, even as they relate to, to the life of a leper or someone who has leprosy. David saying, Lord, if we can relate to that, Lord, Lord, take this thing away from me, this thing that is despised, this thing that is dreaded. Lord, take it from me and make me clean. How many of us have found ourselves there? Why is it that over and over and over again, we simply turn back to what we say, God, I'm not going to do it anymore if you just forgive me this one time. Why is it that over and over again, we find ourselves in the same situation? Why? Because we have not been washed thoroughly from the inside out. And now, cleanse me, Lord. Take these things away from me. I don't want to be who I am in the natural. Oh, all these understanding of what's going on here. David now finding himself in this situation, knowing, knowing exactly what's going on, and David desiring inward change. Notice, notice what he goes on to say in verse 3. For I, I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. No, no, notice what happens. Oftentimes when, when there's accusation, when someone is saying, but I know who you are, I know what you've done, I, you've, I, I know, and what do we want to, we, we, it's, it is natural for the human element to want to try to impress others that those things have never happened. Remember Saul. Saul falling and, and doing what he was, every time that Saul was confronted by Samuel or someone else, he would always find a reason why he did what he did. Always blaming, always saying, I did it because. Uh, but, but, but here, David, no, notice, he, here was David saying, saying, I acknowledge my transgression. I know what I've done. I know that what I did was wrong. It should have never happened. 
I'm, I'm not going to deny it. I'm not going to dis- dismiss it. I'm not going to make excuses about it. I don't want to blame any other person about it. I acknowledge what I have done. And I share these thoughts with you. Because ultimately, you will see and understand that though there will be ramifications, David yet maintains his ultimate purpose from God. I don't know how many of us, once again, want our purpose from God. Why, why, why has God, we say that we have been reserved for such a time as this. You and I have been born for now. For now. And how many of us want what God wants for the very reason why he reserved us for now? He acknowledges his sin. And what I've come to understand is that that is what the Lord requires. Do you want God's purpose in your life? Do you want God's promises in your life? Do you want the house that God has built for you to be blessed of God? That applies to us now. But we have to acknowledge it. Notice what he says. And my sin is ever before me. Just acknowledging, oh, I know. I know what I've done. I can't get it out of my mind. I, I know that I'm the reason why he died in battle. I know. Over and over and over again, I remember what I have done. It's staring me right in my face. My sin is ever before me. I don't know if you've been there before. But one thing I've learned, even as a child of God, is that when we deliberately get out of the will of God and get into the will of the flesh, oftentimes there are consequences and ramifications. But yet for the true child of God, there is something that will also be present. And that is conviction in your heart. If you were a child of God and you can live your life, if you profess to be a child of God and you can live your life like the devil, no acknowledgement, no repentance, no forgiveness, no conviction, I'm here to tell you, you are treading on dangerous territory. For the ministry of the Spirit of God is to convict is to discipline, is to correct. And if there is nothing in our heart and mind that is revealing to us, you better get back in line. You better shape up or, 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 or else. And I'm speaking in layman's terms in our vernacular. You, let, let me go even further. You better get it together, brother and sister in Christ. Because there's a reason why The Spirit of God brings conviction. And that is to get us back in line with His will and with His purpose because of His tender mercies and His loving kindness. That's the God that we serve. David admits that he sinned. And what I've come to the realization is 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 that in reality for us, listen, if we've ever been there before, If you're living under condemnation or degradation, what I want to remind you of is you have to go to the right source, the God of the Bible. You have to acknowledge. Don't deny it. Don't dismiss it. Don't make excuses about it. Don't blame others because of it. Acknowledge it. Admit it unto the living God. He says in verse 4, against thee, the only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speak and be clear when thou judgest. Now, now there are those who say, what what, what does David mean that against thee and only I have sinned? Oh, yes, he committed an atrocity. Yes, he, he, what he did to Uriah was wrong. What he even did to Bathsheba was wrong. But in reality, the sin was against the most high God. God establishes the, the standards. Now, 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 being brought, this being brought to light is devastating him. 
his heart, his spirit, how he was feeling now in that situation. And David is saying here, God, I sinned against heaven and you. And, and this is he's saying, and what, though I want your tender mercy, and, and though I want your loving kindness, but I understand I've sinned against heaven and you, and whatever punishment you see fit to do, I deserve it. And David knows that whatever judgment God makes on his life or in that matter, it will be fully deserved. That is the acknowledgement of those who have a genuine desire for repentance and forgiveness. He conveys the thought, behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in my sin did my mother conceive me. The source of David's sin was the fallen nature. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, we all have, have, have that nature, the sinful nature. We all have had it since conception. Listen, I said this in the past. How many, how many understand and know that you and I are with a sinful nature? You and I did not have to go to, 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 to how to lie 101. And I'm talking about not tell the truth. Come on, how many of you would say that, you just, that that was just something that you simply learned to do on your own? Oh, we've been there. We've been there. But, but, but notice what happens. What, what, no, 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 he, he says this, I was shaped in iniquity. I'm, I'm going to continue to go, go a little faster. Because I want to get to the end. He says, he says, behold, thou desireth truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me no wisdom. In the hidden part, in the secret place, in our innermost being. Listen, nobody might know who you are, but you. Everyone might have an idea of who you are and how are you, how you, how you are, but only you truly know who and how you truly are. But, but notice what he says, what he says, thou shalt make me know wisdom. So, so in verse seven, he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, there's so much that I have here. And I, I want you to understand what, he, what he's saying. His, David's request is for God to take away his sin. Purge me. He says, purge me with hyssop. Hyssop, the Old Testament priests, what would they do? They use hyssop. It was a leafy plant to sprinkle blood or water on a person being ceremoniously cleaned from defilements such as leprosy and touching of a dead body. They would have to go through that process of being purged with hyssop. And now David, change me, purge me. Understanding when he says purge me, he's saying, God, do whatever is necessary to get me where you want me to be. Make me to hear the joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Oh, I'm just going to read this psalm to you. Continue to read. I, I have so much point, so many points that I want to give you, but, but, but I, I, I'm not going to share them with you today. David says, he, he says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones with it which thou hast broken may rejoice. The emotion of knowing I've gotten out of your will that I've let you down. Oh, I, I, want, to, I want to feel the joy of my relationship with you once again. Oh, oh understand through the, the, all these, these verses, he, he goes on to say in verse nine, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Now ashamed of his sin himself. David now, ashamed that any should see them or be aware, ashamed that others are aware, ashamed that he failed God. Failed God. And because of the holiness of God, he knew that, he, that this must have been something that was a, an abominable situation in the sight of God. Now, he says, blot out all my iniquities. To blot. This word, by implication, to erase. Have you been there before? Have you been in a place where you knew once again that you were out of God's will? And yet here, here the, the, the idea of David is it's just, it's just, God, can you just blot it out, erase it from my life? And I'm here to tell you that the God that we serve is able to do that very thing in your life and in mine. I don't know if you, listen, is there anyone great here, grateful today, once again, that the God that we serve is able to erase anything that you have fallen short of in your life? That is the God that we serve. How does he do it? Well, he doesn't go to Office Max and get an eraser. He doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, he doesn't take anything to, to just simply uh, try to pretend that it was never there. 
But you know what he does? He looks at you and he looks at you and he looks at you and he looks at me and he determines that by virtue of our relationship with Jesus Christ, his son, he takes a, a portion, hypothetically speaking, no one's going to let me give you this demonstration. And as though he takes the blood of Jesus that Jesus shed for you and he goes and he covers the multitude and he erases the presence of your sin. Why? Because he does it through the blood of Jesus Christ. That is how we are forgiven on this side of life. Now, now, David says, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Create. You do it, God. You see, so many times we say, well, 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 well we, we, this is what we, yes, we did. There are times when we have to do our part without question, we have to do our part. But when we say to God, purge me, when we say to God, cleanse me, when we say to God, wash me, when we say to God, create in me, we're giving God the authority to do whatever is necessary to allow that very situation to occur in our lives. Oh, God, change me. And then something happens that brings you to your knees. Oh, God, don't change me like that. Change me another way. God desires you and I to be who is ordained for us to be. And now notice what happens. Oh, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me. Notice what he says. And uphold me with thy spirit. I don't know if any of you have ever, once again, fallen short, have sinned, have gotten out of the will of God. But I know when I have found myself in those situations in my life, there's something that comes upon me that makes me realize I don't like to feel the way that I feel right now. That's why it's hard sometimes to come before the presence of God and worship because there's unrepentant sin or we've allowed ourselves to get out of the will of God and now we say, oh Lord, here's my worship and yet we can never enter into genuine worship. Now, 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 David goes on to say all these things, but if you do this, if you cleanse me, if you restore me yeah, unto me, the joy of, of my, thy salvation and hold me free. He, he, says, he says, I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be co converted unto thee. He says, if you forgive me, if you cleanse me, if you restore me, listen, I'm not going to take it for granted. I'm not going to just say, okay, thank you, merciful, loving, kindness, God. I'm not going to say, Lord, okay, I'm going to do it again because I know you'll forgive. No, no, he says, if you do this, if you restore to me the joy, if you give me back what I had, if you allow me to experience all that I had before this situation, I will teach transgressors thy ways. I'll tell others about you. I'll tell them about, about your love. I'll tell them about your forgiveness. I will reveal to them your kindness. I will not let my situation, your mercy that you have displayed to me, I will not just keep it to myself. I will let others know of your mercy, oh God. That's what David goes on to say. He says, deliver me from the blood guilt guiltiness, oh God. Thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud all of thy righteousness. Oh, how many of us can experience the kind of joy when we come? Oh, when we come to praise the living God. Come on now, how many, how many, how many, how many of you, let me give you, the, let me give you this, this, this analogy. Imagine that you, as those that came to David, were discontent, in debt, and in distress. Imagine if you and I were indebted beyond imagination. Can any of us relate to that? Can any of us say, well, Brother David, I don't have to imagine that because... I know what that's like. Imagine this. Imagine that one day in that situation, you would get a phone call or you would get a letter. You would get some form of acknowledgement that every one of your debts was now going to be canceled. What would you do? Come on, somebody. Come on, come on. Somebody said, praise God. Somebody said, rejoice. I'd venture to say that somebody would fall out not believe in what was occurring. Maybe there'd be someone who would scream and, and not, and maybe, maybe they would start dancing like David when he, when he brought the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know. But imagine the experience of having that situation occur in your life. 
Come on now. Can, can we be transparent? Oh, oh, this is not transparent like it used to be. Uh, can, can, we be can we just be real with one another? How many of you would rejoice if all of a sudden, if you have a mortgage, that your mortgage was paid in full? Come on, anybody in this place. Now, now. Yes, we can relate to that. I don't want to pay that mortgage bill. And yes, that's me too. But now imagine that you get a letter that was written and penned by a man inspired by the Holy Spirit of God that would convey to you and to me that all of your debt has been paid in full. What would you do? Come on now. Would you rejoice? What, what, what if we came to that understanding that that is the very thing that Jesus has done for us. I don't hear any rejoicing. I don't hear anybody saying, praise God. I didn't even hear anyone say, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But that is the God that we serve. Let me keep going and I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. I, I, I know that, that sometimes I go a little long, but you guys, all, many of you have given me permission to go, to go for two hours. I have not taken on, you up on that yet, but, but, but don't worry, I'm thinking about it. I'm just kidding. Let me show you what happens. Let me share with you what occurs in David as we continue to read once again. And I would encourage you to go back and read this in depth. I, I had to miss a lot of the points that I, that I was going to make for, for the sake of brevity of time. But listen to what it says here. Psalm 51, verse 15. Da David says these words. Let me see if I forgot 14. He, David says these words. Listen to what he says. Oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Verse 16. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delighted not in burnt offering, not in rituals. You don't delight in the fact that we're just simply coming to church. You don't, you don't delight in because we're doing this or the do's and don'ts. We're, you don't delight in us because we're simply going through the motions. David is saying this, that there is no sacrifice that would be enough to satisfy God for the terrible sins that we have committed. But David says this, what you truly desire is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Notice what he says in 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. There's repentance. There's remorse. Now, now you're not rejoicing in what has happened. You, you're, you're ready to get that, that behind you. You're ready for forgiveness. He says, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Oh God, that you will not despise. A contrite, a heart that is genuine and sincere of their now inner emotion of what they have done. And David goes on to say in verse 51, 18, do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thy walls of Jerusalem. Verse 19, then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. David is basically saying this. Remembering if you do this, God, if you forgive me, if you cleanse me, if you purge me, if you restore within me, if you created me a clean heart, help me to experience the joy the, what, the, of my salvation. If you do this, if I can get there, I will teach transgressors your ways. I will be restored to my rightful place of what you have desired for me to do. And notice what he says, do good in thy pleasure unto Zion, which build the, the, thou the walls of Jerusalem. David is saying this, let your will be done, God. Let your will be done. May the purposes of God go before anything and everything that we desire and want. In, in other words, we know that the heart of God is to build up the walls of Jerusalem. He said, then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness and burnt offering, whole offering uh, burnt, and whole burnt offerings, then shall they offer bullocks upon the altar. David is basically saying this, when we get to where you want us to be, when we repent, when we turn away, when we ask for forgiveness and we're restored, then we will share with others the good news of the living God. Lord, you do this according to your good pleasure. Let your will be done. And when we are abiding in the will of God, it says, then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. When we are in the will of God. So I've said all of this to give you these, let me just give you these. For those of you that are taking notes, those of you, I, I want you to see this because there, there's some things that, if, can, can you give me 10 minutes? 10 minutes, 10 minutes at the most. Because this is what I want you to understand through the heart of this message. It's not for condemnation. It's not to condemn anyone for what maybe they have done. Because if that's the case, then I'm condemning myself. This is to give you hope. 
This is to give you hope of restoration, of cleanliness in the sight of God, of holiness. In this Psalm, there are what I was able to find five different areas that are very important. Five areas that you and I will have to experience. Number one, in verses one and two, there is the plea for forgiveness. Do you want forgiveness? Yes, you've gotten out of the will of God, but that does not have to define who you are and where you're going. But there must be a plea for forgiveness. And I'm referring to a plea with God. Yes, there might be ramifications, those that we have to deal with on an earthly level, but ultimately it is with God. There is also in this Psalm, the place of confession where David acknowledged what occurred. David didn't try to run from it. He acknowledged it unto the living God. He began to pray for moral and spiritual cleanness. In other words, Lord, create, Lord, change, Lord, purge. Come into my life, Lord. I know I was wrong. I know I should not never have done those things, God. But I know that you can change me. And I'm going to give you the right and the authority to come into my life by your spirit and make me new. Whatever it takes to change me. That's what David did. And David said, if you do this in my life, then I promise to be renewed in my service to you. The reason why I have been born. The reason why you have created me. The reason why you've given me a platform to speak what thus saith the Lord. This is what I will do. And ultimately, the last portion of this verse, of this psalm, was a petition or a prayer for national restoration at the last few verses. In essence, saying, God, let your will be done because I know this is what your will is. We have to find ourselves in those situations. We have to plea for forgiveness. We have to place a, 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 be a, reach a place of confession. We need to pray for change, inward change from the inside. We, we need to be restored and renewed to what God has ordained for us personally, ultimately, that his will will, will will be made known. So with that in mind, as Brother Corey comes back up, let me give you five verses that I want you to hold on to. I see a number of you are taking notes. I see them. If you've ever found yourself in a place where you have fallen short of God's glory and you desire forgiveness and you desire restoration, and you say, Lord, please, please. I, I skipped over the, the, even, even the verse where he says, don't take your, your Holy Spirit from me. Remembering what Saul had done. Remembering how the Spirit had left Saul. He said, no, I, yes, I know I've fallen short, but, but don't take your Spirit from me. Five verses that I want you to hear. And I want you to believe for your life even now. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, listen to this, this, this verse. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Did you get that? Did you hear that? You've fallen short. You're guilty. You've done it. Yes, you acknowledge it. This verse says, repent. So here, an invitation is given. Repent. But don't just repent. Don't just turn away from that situation. Because it goes on to say, and turn to God. Repent and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out. How many of us want our sins to be wiped out? Come on, somebody. Anybody in this? Somebody, please help me preach this message. Number two, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so you were not harmed in any way by us. Listen to it. Here it is, verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow. There's sorrow because of what you've done where you've been godly sorrow there must be godly sorrow 
Because if you've really reached this place where you now are repentant and now you're saying, Lord, forgive me, Lord, cleanse me, Lord, purge me. The Bible says that that type of sorrow leads or brings repentance that leads to salvation. There must be godly sorrow. Number three, Jeremiah 31, 19. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the disgrace of my youth. What, what is he saying here? Jeremiah acknowledging what he had done. At some point, you and I have to acknowledge it. We have to acknowledge it at, 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 to the living God. What do, you, what, do you mean to the, what do you mean we have to acknowledge? Listen to this. For that person, once again, you're under your self-condemnation. You're under your self-degradation. You don't believe that God can use you. You don't believe that God loves you. You don't believe that God has a plan for your life. You don't believe that now you have a future and a home. You don't believe any of these things because of your life and what you've done. Listen to this. Word, one of the most powerful words in the, verses in the Word of God. First, first John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you hear that? If we confess our sins, if you confess your sins, you must confess them. You don't deny them. You don't try to hide them. You confess them. He is faithful to forgive. I'm here to tell someone today that he is faithful to forgive and he is able to cleanse. That's the God that we serve. Don't be under that condemnation. Don't be under, yes, yes, you've done it. Yes, you've been there. Don't, don't, don't be convinced of the enemy that God is no longer desiring to use your life. I'm here to tell you that there is forgiveness, that there is restoration, and there is cleansing in the sight of God. But you must confess. You must confess. Number five, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. It's time for the body of Christ to say, I understand your situation and your circumstance. It's time for the body of Christ to stop condemning the brothers and sisters in Christ and, and, and using judgment to send people to hell. We are not in an authority. We are not in a position. God has not given us that responsibility to condemn people. We are to, once again, as the Bible says, we are to restore that person gently in the sight of God. That scripture is Galatians 6.1. So let me give you these last three verses and I want, you to con I, want to, I want to confirm what I just said. Listen to what it says here. Hosea 6.1. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. So let us return unto the Lord. If you've fallen short, if you've blown it along the way, if you messed up, I'm here to tell you, I'm going to say these words emphatically. Come, let us return to the Lord. That is what the word declares. If that is you, then come and return to the Lord. Listen to what it says. Isaiah 1, 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. They are, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God says to you, I will cleanse you. I will restore you. I will forgive you. I will wash you. I will purge you. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. I am the God that restores and healeth thee. That is the God that we serve. That is the God that we serve. Now look, Isaiah 61, 7, and then I'm done. Isaiah 61, 7. If you're living under shame, if you're living under condemnation, if you're living under unforgiveness, if you're living under any of those things, listen to what it says, Isaiah 61, 7. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. That's what the Lord says to his covenant people. And I'm here to tell you that that is what the same God will say to you and to me. Come on, people. Are those not shouting words for someone even in this place? There is restoration. There is restoration. Oh, through the Chronicles of David, we learn how God can take a man who is after his own heart and has fallen short of the glory of God and restore him to his position that he has ordained. I don't know about you, people of God, but that gives me hope. That makes me, can I just use this word? That makes me happy. Is there anyone else here today that says, oh, but the promises of God are for me? 
That is the God that we serve. Listen, people of God, these promises are for those who will respond, those who will take them and say, Lord, I want them. Is there anyone here once again that wants what God has for you? It's all in the word of God. Come on, brother, go ahead and speak to us. Everyone needs compassion. Love that's there.